So schools today are facing some very challenging conditions and environments. Increasing class sizes, decreasing budgets, increasing complexity with more devices, more cables, and ultimately that leads to teachers being tethered to a desk in the corner of the room. And that creates a lot of challenges from a teacher's perspective, as you guys all well know, is how do you, as a teacher, better engage your students? How do you foster that collaboration? How do you create that student-centered student learning model? And so it, it's a very tough environment uh, for teachers to be able to get their students engaged. And so uh, with that, um, what I'd like to do is bring up our first guest speaker, Nathan Myers from uh, Mesa Public Schools. As I said, he's the Director of Technology uh, Education, Education Technology at Mesa Public Schools, which is the largest school district in the state. And Nathan and his team are responsible for all the coaching, the training, and the professional learning of, of uh, the technologies that are deployed in the classroom. He and his team not only help the teachers understand the technology, but actually how to leverage the technology, get the most out of that technology to create that one-to-one -one learning environment, that student-centered model that we've been talking about. And so with that, I'd like to hand this over to Nathan uh, to share their vision, their strategy of how they're dealing with these challenges at Mesa. Thank you very much, Jay. Good afternoon. Uh, in the time that I have this afternoon, I would like to share with each of you our district's journey as we look toward changing the types of technologies that the, our teachers had access to in the classroom and how wireless displays quickly became a, became a keystone component of the new model that we were working to develop. I'd like to share with you some details regarding our decision to implement wireless display technology in every classroom uh, throughout our district, as well as very specifically why we decided to move forward with the Action Tech model. Um, and then toward the end, I'd like to kind of talk about the work that went in toward implementing uh, these technologies to the scale of our district and what we're doing to, as Jay mentioned, support our teachers as they're just exploring and beginning to effectively leverage these technologies uh, to which they now have access. Quickly to kind of get into it, just kind of an overview of uh, Mesa Public Schools. Uh, as Jay mentioned, we are located in Mesa, Arizona, uh, which is just about 20 minutes southeast of the state capital of Phoenix. Um, it is, Mesa is the 38th largest school in the nation, which is actually something I discovered a week ago making this presentation. I thought that was kind of cool, so I figured I'd share. But um, in our district, uh, being the largest in the state, we do cover a 200 square mile area of the valley. Uh, and in that square mile, so basically uh, in order to get from one corner of the school district to the other in good traffic and with the help of a freeway, it takes a little over half an hour. But uh, within our boundaries, we have at the high school level, uh, which are grades 9 through 12, we have six comprehensive high schools. At the junior high level, which is grades seven through eight in Mesa Public Schools, we have 11 junior highs. And then down at the K-6 range for our elementary school, we have 55 sites within our boundaries. Uh, and if you're doing the quick mental math, um, 78 sites, that leaves a little extra. We have a handful of what we call choice or focus schools within our district special programs. Our student body is just over 63,000 students district-wide, uh, which gives us 3,800 certificated staff. That includes all of our teachers and our certificated administrators as well. Just quickly over the network, um, with the changes that have occurred recently that we'll begin talking about here in a moment, uh, we do get to boast the largest network in the state above our universities within the state and our health network as well. Um, part of our initiatives that we'll talk about have been to increase the robustness of our wireless network so that we have sidewalk to sidewalk Wi-Fi coverage on every one of our school sites and in every classroom. And in order to do that, we have had to add 16,000 data drops to expand our network to handle that kind of coverage. But we wanted to focus there first to start beginning to build a network that would support what we're trying to do in the classroom with our uh, leveraging the technology. 
<clears throat> and then finally, we're fortunate enough in Mesa to actually have two divisions and two departments that support uh, our technology initiative simultaneously. We have information systems, which is a traditional IT department. They oversee the network, server room, the switches and closets, make sure the computer's image. Uh, they oversee the techs that come out to do repairs, as well as our help desk. So they're a traditional IT department. Uh, I have the fortune of overseeing the educational technology department, and as Jay mentioned, that department is, consists solely of certified educators who have spent years in the classroom and have come out of the classroom as teacher specialists to work teacher to teacher to help teachers understand and leverage technology effectively anywhere technology and curriculum touch, which now, this day and age, is everywhere. So, uh, we have that opportunity to kind of divide and conquer. Uh, information system sits under our business services division. Educational and technology sits under the curriculum services division as well. Okay. So our journey uh, with regard to our presentation today kind of began back in 2012. The fall of 2012, we put before our voters in Mesa a $230 million bond initiative, <coughs> which we put in front of them to do things in the district that desperately needed done, but in other ways we could not afford to do because of budget shortfalls, the state of the economy at the time as well. So a lot of that money went toward upgrading our facilities. Uh, much of it went toward a very aging transportation fleet, but a significant amount of that went toward the investment of our wireless and network infrastructure and exploring different educational technologies to use in the classroom, teacher devices, student devices. We ran a series of pilots uh, that we'll talk a little bit about here today. Um, <clears throat> we focused first, we're now in a, uh, the third year of that five-year implementation. So the first year we focused very hard, as I mentioned earlier, on increasing the strength of our underlying network because we wanted to build up what was then going to support some very uh, strong initiatives in the classroom. While we were doing that, we wanted to address something that we had to ignore for several years, which was an aging fleet of classroom computers. At the time, we could guarantee at least one computer in every classroom for administrative use for the teacher, taking attendance, creating lesson plans, uh, connecting to a projector to facilitate the learning that was going on in the classroom. But because we had had to ignore our traditional refresh cycle, which was every three to four years, a lot like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. We'd start at one side of the district, go through in three years, and then start all over again. We would have that regular computer cycle. But since we had to ignore several recess, refresh cycles, many of our computers were seven, eight, nine, a decade old. In areas where we were fortunate enough to have newer computers, they were still aging and in need of upgrades, but they were not only aging physically with their hardware, but they were also part of an older model that we kind of wanted to get away from as, how far, as far as how teachers utilize computers in the classroom. In our personal lives, I mean, nobody can argue this is very much a mobile society. We want our information where we are, when we are, get it wirelessly. It needs to be at our fingertips. And personally, we are all there at this point in time. But professionally, we weren't at the time, up until we had started this progression, to offer that same type of access to technology professionally to our teachers. And that's where we wanted to be, because that's where we knew the power in leveraging computers in the classroom were going to come from. So what we did was we went on kind of a journey as far as exploring the leading devices at the time, mobile devices. and brought us to seven device candidates spread across four different manufacturers. And we worked with those manufacturers uh, to create a series of demonstration rooms. And over a three week period, we invited in every single one of our teachers to our central district offices to go through a series of rooms dedicated to each manufacturer where they could put their hands on the devices and go through each one of them to provide their feedback to us. Uh, I had trainers in every room that we became familiar with the device and I had them rotate daily so that they would become familiar with all of the devices regardless of the outcome of the um, voting decision. And they asked, answered questions, facilitated the hands-on uh, activities of the teachers. We gave them a series of instructions to run through so that they could run through those same types of protocols, typical of what they would do in their classroom, and compare apples to apples at the end. 
<clears throat> when they were done with their sessions, we asked them to go to a Google form, submit their information, what they loved about their favorite device, what they hated about their least favorite device, and we tabulated all of that information to come up with something that would serve our purposes and something that the teachers definitely wanted to have in their hands. As we were doing this, we were also introducing another component. Because the device was everything, anywhere they needed it, it would replace ultimately the towers in the classroom. But admittedly, this is an amazing presentation tool. But kind of sort of tiny when you're spending over an hour on it developing a PowerPoint presentation or a lesson plan. So what we did also was part of this uh, movement was toward a docking station. We had sampled several docking stations so that we would maintain in classrooms that had the updated monitors, we would maintain the monitor, the keyboard, and the mouse and connect whatever device they were using to it so that they could take advantage of a full-size screen to do their administrative and developmental tasks and have that somewhere in the room that was their station. But otherwise, and this was the third component of what we were doing, we knew that we wanted to not only provide them with that wireless, anytime, anywhere access to their information as administrators of a classroom, as decision makers for making data-driven decisions on the direction of their, what's going on in the classroom, but we also wanted to give it to them as facilitators of the learning when they were in front of <coughs> students. So we were also experimenting with several different types of wireless display technologies. Uh, we had ViewSonic in play, we had Netgear, and then we also had the Action Tech going. <clears throat> and this wasn't necessarily something that the teachers were aware of as far as what we were experimenting with, but we were modeling firsthand the power and the impact of how that might change the way you present information. I mean, we are sitting on top, as far as accessing the internet, we have such a wealth of online resources is ridiculous, whether that's YouTube or Khan Academy or websites with virtual manipulatives. Um, just the types of information that you can access to solidify and build your point while you're sitting in front of kids is ridiculous. And having to be tied to the corner of a classroom where at best you're sitting sideways because if there's a ceiling mounted projector, this is where your port is or at worst with your back to the kids because the cords are too short or you know and once you made that decision that's where the computer was all the time didn't matter who took over that room or how they wanted to orient it <clears throat> that was the layout of the room and it was very cost prohibitive um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go too so we wanted to kind of open the teachers eyes to this possibility of being anywhere. So if you needed to walk to the back of the room to handle a, a problem going on and Fred Jones a couple of kids with your proximity, you could certainly do that. Okay. So we went through, worked with those three devices. At the end of the uh, decision making process, when all of the uh, uh, votes were in, we took a look and very highly scrutinized and, and examined the teacher feedback. Uh, we went with the uh, Lenovo Helix, which is a hybrid device. You can detach the tablet, battery here, battery there. Uh, best of both worlds, you've got a great presentation tablet, the brains of the machine, and then you've also got a keyboard uh, for productivity. And obviously, as far as wireless uh, displays, we went with the Action Tech device for actually a couple reasons. While we were examining the performance of all of them together, we were very closely looking at not only its dependability as far as connecting correctly each time, but maintaining the longevity of that, co that connection over the course of the day or the class period. Uh, and also, the profile uh, was a very compact device, and this was cool because essentially what we were doing, and you'll see in here in just a moment, our model drastically change and we condensed a lot of the types of educational technology tools that were available to our teachers and this particular profile allowed itself where we were using short throw projectors to basically just velcro this to the underside and give us a six inch HDMI cord and we were good to go so we cut all cables and shortened the ones the few that we needed <coughs> so 
Also, by using short throw projectors, we were able to take advantage of the whiteboard projected surface, uh, which was much larger. In fact, as we were going through this, we started to see that this new model was actually kind of replacing a lot of functionality of more traditional technology tools that you'll find all throughout our district. Um, interactive whiteboards certainly being one of them. With an interactive whiteboard, uh, you've got the ability to stand in front of the class, but again, you've got your back to them when you are teaching. And you're tethered at best by a 16-foot USB cable. Okay, so you've always got that leash going on. Well, in 90% of the instances where we've got an interactive whiteboard in the classroom, the teachers are really after the software, which is on the computer. They want to be able to physically manipulate a virtual manipulative. It's all in the software. They want to be able to take the stylus or the marker and write notes and move things around. And that's exactly why we wanted a touch interface on the tablet, because all of those things are in the hands of the teacher no matter where they are in the room. So the software is there, and it kind of started to, in many situations, and in a lot of situations, you've got a very valid reason you want that tactile experience for young learners to come up and do that. But you also have this device. So if I were writing a problem on the board and I wanted somebody to solve it in the classroom, I could set it on the desk in front of them, hand them the stylus, and ask them to go ahead and solve that problem or work that out to exemplify that for the class. Now, understandably, there was a large portion of our teacher population that was a little reticent to hand their tablet to a six-year-old first grader. So, interestingly, what that kind of did was that started to breathe new life into some older technologies that were starting to collect dust because we went with a tablet, a very mobile wireless device. What we were able to do, especially for our younger learners, is take the USB dongle, plug it into the bottom of the tablet, and the student the plastic wireless slate, which they were very happy and eager to do. It was entirely engaging. And now you have two people who are in complete control of what's being projected. The student with the pen and the slate can then write up on the board the projection, and the teacher who has the device itself has control with the stylus as well. So you very quickly started to expand your ability to collaborate and work together on things, and uh, it also eased teachers' nerves to take a $1,000 device and put it in the hands of a kindergarten or first grader. <coughs> Document cameras kind of started to come under call, too. Uh, I've been in educational technology long enough, I remember when we first started introducing this document camera technology to teachers. And we would put it in front of them, and before training got started, it was always, because you know how easy it is to change culture and, and introduce new technology sometimes, they would look at us with their vis-a-vis -vis stained fingertips and point to us and say, well, what exactly am I supposed to do with that thing? when I've got this overhead. Well, interestingly enough, the technology obviously caught on because it was helpful. It offered more services and more capability than they had with their overhead projector. Now, when we come back to them and say, hey, we've got something better for you, the resistance is still the same, and the response I get is, you know, you can have my document camera when you can pry it out of my cold, dead fingers, okay? So, but we're working with our teachers because really, the document camera, you had still images, you were able to move physical manipulatives, opaque manipulatives, and display it on the screen. They love that. Capture a still image, maintain it, do different things with it. Zoom in, zoom out. When you're coupling a tablet with a rear-facing webcam and being able to display wirelessly, you've got all the same capabilities, if not more. So if I'm a teacher and I am facilitating a lesson, and I want to, and I'm floating the classroom, working with students, and I want to kind of bring to everybody's attention what a student in the back of the room is working on. I can very quickly go to the camera app, which because I am connecting wirelessly, I've got live video going on, which has a ton of use as far as how I'm projecting, but I can take that, go to a student in the back of the room, can I get you to hold that real quick? And if you'll turn it toward me, please allow the camera to focus, and just take a snapshot. And then what I can do, and I'm still using the app that is embedded in the system, I'll pull that open, grab my stylus, 
I could put this image into a PowerPoint presentation, into a Word document, into my favorite annotation software, uh, but just for a down and dirty demonstration, I'm going to open this with Paint, which is about as old as Windows itself and has been on every edition. But again, it's there and it certainly has its purposes. So if I need to just very quickly annotate something, draw everybody's attention to the front of the room for a teachable moment, talk about something, underline, annotate, do whatever it is that I need to do. And then I can, because it's all integrated, it's all in this device, I can save the image. I can upload it to my classroom website. I can put it in an email. I can make it archived to where either I as a teacher can come back to it next week and say, hey, remember when? and let's pick up where we left off, or a student who was absent can have access to it or review on their own. Because part of the blended learning that we want to get into is that anytime, anywhere access where the student can self-pace. And by archiving what we do and having that ability to do it quickly, we put ourselves in a better position to move that direction. Okay. Now, for those teachers who want a more stable hand, and something that is going to allow them to work with a manipulative and don't really want to hold it, there is actually a very cheap and intriguing option that I really wish I could take credit for, but I can't. Uh, and I also don't know who to credit for this, so I'm going to share it with everybody. And uh, you familiar with what this is? If you've never seen one, this is a locker stand. You can buy it anywhere, Target, Amazon, Walmart, usually for five to 10 bucks a pop, but beginning of school sales, back to school sales, if you're lucky, you can pick one up for a buck or two at Big Lot. What you do is you take your rear facing webcam, put the tablet face down, and then you can place any manipulative underneath it, whether that is a writing assignment that you're doing to highlight the process, or you're demonstrating what coins look like to elementary school kids. I mean, you still have all of that same access, but a much more powerful device and a very cheap and reasonable um, stand. Okay. And this is beginning to catch on. Um, I've been asked a couple of times, how long have we been doing this? Well, this actually, we've started implementing wireless technology throughout our district last spring. So we rolled through our 78 sites with it, beginning to train them, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And so really, this is our first full year, or will be our, the conclusion of our full, first full year of implementation. And it is catching on. The teachers love to be untethered. And that's how we branded this initiative within the district, is teaching and facilitating learning untethered. No cables, charge device, connecting wirelessly to the projector for direct instruction. And it's amazing, and our teachers very much appreciate it. So, and it has also had a significant impact on our meeting culture. We've made sure to install wireless display in all of our conference rooms. So again, we don't have the presentation computer. We don't mess with pulling flash drives in and out of computers to present what you have. You bring your device, computer labs build themselves where people show up, and then you tap into the presentation so that everybody can see it and discuss it. Okay. So behind the scenes, you know, I mentioned our information systems department, and they were, very, they were responsible for configuring the devices and installing the devices. And they were a little terrified at the thought of deploying 3,600 devices for which they would have to have boots on the ground if there was a particular problem. So uh, we were fortunate enough to be one of the districts that worked with Action Tech at that point in time uh, as they were developing their uh, management system. So with the management system from a central location, our IS department can configure the devices and name them. Uh, when you pull it out of the box, it's got a random alphanumeric name, which means nothing to no one. So you, we reconfigure the name so that the name of the device themselves is the school. So if I was at Red Mountain High School, room 123, then it would be RMHS underscore RM123. And that allows our teachers, where all of these are going in consecutive rooms, to identify the correct one. Uh, we also set it to, there are many options for configuration. Um, you can have it demand a passcode that is displayed. So what happens is you tap into the device, you find it, it's broadcasting its name, you choose it, uh, anything Windows 8.1 or above, and you can also use Windows 7 
uh, devices as well with the dongle. Um, it will display a 10-digit uh, passcode. Type that into your device, do the initial pairing, and then you're off to the races. You can have that happen every single time. In our district, what we chose to do to eliminate that loss of time is the first time a teacher pairs their device with the wi uh, wireless display unit in their classroom, they have to do that. Make that initial pairing, uh, but once they've done that, that relationship has been set, they pull out the tray, they find what they've paired with, and then they're off to the races. There's very minimal time. Uh, we did want that passcode to display so that a student sitting in this room could not hijack the wide, uh, wireless display unit sitting in the other room. Uh, the other thing that we set it for too is it's nice once that pairing relationship has happened and somebody is using the wireless display it is no longer broadcasting itself on the network you can't see it anywhere okay uh, but with this uh, central management system we can configure the devices we can group them in our network per school district uh, the IES team can restart or reset our help desk has access to this control management system as well so that they can troubleshoot over the phone with teachers and get them going remotely. So information systems problem was how do we manage 3,600 devices? Educational technologies challenge was how do we change the culture for 3,600 teachers and do that effectively and, and, and start to change how teaching is being facilitated through technology in the classroom. We rolled these out uh, school at a time, actually several schools at a time. Information systems would come, configure the device, install it, get it plugged in. We would follow behind and go to that school next. We were doing several schools uh, a day for a while there where I would send a team of trainers. We'd have a lead trainer do a hands-on presentation. We're all very tactile people and want to put our hands on, especially where technology is concerned. So that was invaluable to be able to do that for them. So we would go in, very quick overview, 20, 25 minute overview, show them how to, how to connect and pair their device with the wireless display. And then immediately with their knowledge, because we are changing things quickly, new devices, new technology for wireless displays. So with the knowledge that they had, what could they do tomorrow morning? Successful connection, what can you do tomorrow morning to begin to impact and change how things are working in your classroom? And then also kind of shed some light on as they work with their devices and begin to understand it long term as they build their skills, what could they expect to be working toward as well to kind of set that vision. Then we released the trainers, told them, I'm sorry, we released the teachers, asked them to go back to their room, we gave them a half sheet paper of directions on what we had just covered as far as the procedures and told them to go, go back to your class, connect. I had several trainers on campus that merely floated the rooms to make sure that every teacher had successfully connected, that they felt confident for the next day, and then we've got trainers assigned to schools in a rotation. Uh, we, are, we have become experts at building uh, support websites. Uh, this one supports our untethered initiative as a whole and all the multiple components with it. We created a you know, wireless display. And WIDI, I do want to clarify that. WIDI is actually the proprietary Intel technology that can facilitate its short for wireless display. We do not. We actually use the um, Miracast protocol that's available to you through anything Windows 8.1 and higher and uh, that's Wi-Fi enabled. However, WIDI, Wi-Fi, it's stuck just like we launched, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, Proximas as the brand name for the projector. And there are still teachers today who ask for help with their Proxima, even though we have moved beyond. So, you know, it has stuck. Uh, so we affectionately refer to it as WIDI, even though we are using the Miracast protocol. Okay. That's an excellent question. Uh, absolutely zero on our bandwidth, because while it utilizes the Wi-Fi controller in the computer, it does not access our network. It's point to point. So what we're doing, all of this sharing of video uh, and projecting of that information is basically happening between the two devices. It's not going around. We have not, and that was actually a significant, oh, and I'm sorry, let me, let me repeat the two questions. I apologize, uh, and thank you for your patience. So the two questions was, one, um, what has been the impact on our, 
on our bandwidth, our wireless network. And there hasn't been because, again, it's, it's point to point connection. The second question was, have we seen any interference between classrooms? And no, we have not. And we have densely populated high schools, bottom and top, where you can stand in a classroom and see eight or nine different devices all on your list, and then you connect directly. So we really haven't experienced any problems with interference at all. Okay. But it is a process, like everything else. Uh, we are continually working with our teachers, providing professional learning opportunities, modeling working with the principals, because if we can get the principals to buy into this, to utilize it to facilitate staff meetings, working with our content specialists who facilitate professional learning so that we're modeling the use of this technology, we've got a lot better chance of moving it toward the classroom and actually realizing the full potential of what we're trying to do. Um, please contact me if you want to take a picture of this uh, screen. Feel free, that's my direct line and my email address. Uh, if you have questions about our implementation or are curious about anything, I'd be more than happy to uh, talk to you as colleagues. Uh, and I appreciate your time and attention this afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jay. Thank you very much.